Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we get I love you. Do we get I love you now? No, he did say I was his friend a while ago. He did say I was his friend. Well, today is Deaf Awareness Sunday, or actually Hearing Awareness Sunday, as the case may be. The preschool applied for a micro-grant from the Deaf Ministries of the United Methodist Church, and we were awarded it this week. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to check and make sure that we have fire alarms that this guy can hear if his technology fails. Declan has cochlear implants, but if they fail, he is a deaf kid, which is okay. Because if you look at the scripture we just read, it's remarkable in what happens and what does not happen. What happens in the scripture? Look at it a minute. Does Jesus heal a deaf man? Does Jesus heal all deaf men? No, does Jesus say deafness is a curse? Does Jesus say God causes deafness? No. Does Jesus say the man's possessed of a devil or anything like that? No, Jesus does not condemn deafness. He has compassion on one person who's brought to him. But what does he do when he meets the man? He takes him off to the side in private, away from the crowd. He puts his fingers into his ears and he spits on his, he spits and touches his tongue. Then he looks up to heaven and he sighs. And he says one word to him. This is the model for nonverbal communication. There was no codified sign language at that time. I want to tell you a little bit about my experience of working for six years in deaf ministry when I started in the Baltimore Washington Conference as an ordained pastor, how I got there and what it was like. Um, it's a hard road, but first I want to tell you about the, the lesson we read this morning for our call to worship from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Kara, Dr. Oshinsky said, our lovely administrative assistant, Kara, who is very lovely, and he got to deal with her. She's the first person anybody greets when they come to the store, and we're blessed to have her. But she gave me a mug for Christmas last year. She said, don't use this. Don't let anybody know I gave it to you, so don't wrap me out until I told you all. She gave me a mug that says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. <laughs> Which is really funny if you're a preacher. Unfortunately, St. Augustine took a verse out of context that's based on this psalm that we just read from Romans. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the preaching of Christ. Faith comes through hearing. St. Augustine, God bless his little heart, decided that that meant that deaf people were beyond salvation. Because they were beyond salvation. This is the days of the Catholic Church, you've got to remember. Everyone's Catholic who is Christian. If they were not Coptic Christians or, or the Christians in Palestine, but most of the world, we're talking what happened in France right now. Um, and that part of the Roman Empire that was the Holy Roman Empire being the time of Christ not the time of Christ, the time after Christ when the world understood Christianity to mean Roman Catholicism under the Pope. And St. Augustine wrote that if faith comes through hearing, then if you can't hear, you have no faith. Deaf people were not allowed to marry. They were, they were barred from sacraments in the church, and that meant baptism, confirmation. That meant any part in the life of the church deaf people could not participate in. So they were ostracized, they were sort of warehoused, and kept from marrying. They didn't understand why, because they fell in love like any other person did, but they were not allowed to marry. They were not allowed to use their hands to sign either. But it was also a renegade Roman Catholic priest named Père La Paix in France who saw that deaf people were signing with each other. They understood each other very well. He's called the father of both deaf education and deaf ministry because he was the one who learned their language and ministered to them in their language, just as Jesus had communicated with this man in a way he could understand, did not condemn his deafness, but condemned no one or anything, but healed him out of compassion. Let me tell you how I got involved in deaf ministry. It's not the proudest story in my life, because I was not called to deaf ministry. I felt no call to work with deaf persons. I felt no affinity for people with hearing loss. But I worked at a church in Howard County, Glenelg United Methodist Church. I was the student assistant pastor, better known as the SAP. That's what my senior pastor called me. He introduced me, this is my SAP Terry. I'm like, thank you, sir. A deaf couple joined the church. We called them the deaf couple. No one knew their names. They were the deaf people. 
They were the deaf people. They joined because they had been married there by this pastor, and they fell in love with him, and they fell in love with the congregation. They joined the church. $15 a week was what we paid for a sign language interpreter for the worship service. $15 a week in a church that had pretty healthy income at that time. And about six months later, someone on the board said, you know, those deaf people, those deaf people should have to pay for their own interpreter. How many of you are United Methodists? How many of you are members of this or any United Methodist congregation? Do you remember what you promised to do when you joined? You would support the church with what? Your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service. Now your witness as well. But in those days, it was those four prayers, presence, gifts, service. They said they would do all that. We wanted to charge them $15 a week so they could understand the lessons and the service. But then the deaf woman, Debbie, went into the hospital in Washington, D.C. at Walter Reed. And my senior pastor called me and he said, you need to go see Debbie. I said, who's Debbie? The deaf woman. Oh, okay. Because she's in the hospital right around the corner from where you are and I'm not going to drive all the way down there to go see her. You can go see her yourself. I said, do I get to take the interpreter? He said, no. She reads lips pretty well. She speaks very plainly. But I didn't know that because I never said anything other than hi to her as I walked by her very quickly. And I went to see her and I heard the story of her life. I did manage to say to her, and she did speak very clearly, although when you don't hear yourself talk, you lose some of the inflection. So she talked like that, but she talked very clearly. I had to pay a little bit closer attention to her than most people. I said, why are you in Walter Reed? It's a military hospital. And she said, I was an army nurse. She was a registered nurse and a, uh, an officer in the United States Army. But she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, was in the hospital getting chemotherapy, contracted spinal meningitis, woke up the next morning completely deaf, no hearing at all. Most people are not born deaf. Declan's an exception to the rule. Most people become deaf. But I sat there listening to her story, and she told me what happened then. She had been married before. Her husband divorced her because he couldn't handle the cancer, much less a wife who couldn't hear him anymore. She had been raised Roman Catholic, and her priest, I'm not condemning the Roman Catholic Church here, but her priest was so frustrated, he didn't know what to say to her. He stopped visiting her, as did people from her congregation. So she decided life was just a little too hard, because you, cannot, you can do a lot of things if you're deaf. Being an army nurse is not one of them. She lost her career, her income, her husband, her home, her church community. She went into her garage, stuffed a rag in her tailpipe, turned on the car, and waited to die. A neighbor found her. And she took that as a sign that God had something left for her to do with her life. I saw her not long before she died. She said, you're the, what God had me do with my life. You're the one that God wanted me to talk to. Because I left the hospital room. I was ready to graduate. And I had done very well in my ordination exams. I had done very well in my preaching class. I was destined for big churches. But I left that room and I thought, more pastors need to be willing to learn sign language. I said, no, I don't want to do that. But you see, I'd been taking a class called Deaf Ministry, not because I felt any affinity with deaf people or any desire to learn their language, but because it fit my schedule and satisfied a requirement, so I took it. Now, in those days, I could talk to you about angels. That's angel. Everybody loves that sign, right? Cross, Jesus, God. I couldn't say, how's the weather where you are? I couldn't say, how's your husband? How's the dog? I knew nothing but God talk. That was the first time I ever prayed in sign language because I said to her, church, not a word that you can lip, you cannot lip read the word church. She said, I don't know what you're saying. I said, church. She said, how do you know that? And I told her about this course. She said, use what you have. Use what you have. That's when she confessed to me that in those days I preached so fast because I was a new preacher, scared to death. I could do a sermon in two minutes flat. She said, whenever I preached before they got the sign language interpreter, she and her husband would just think about what they're having for lunch because there was no possible way in the world to read my lips. My husband, on the other half, was Southern. And at our wedding, we had an interpreter, and I had deaf guests at my wedding. And my husband, they said, he's from the South. We could read his lips because he spoke nice and slow. But um, I signed church, and then I prayed for the first time in sign language. And I left there, and I told my superintendent, I need to go into deaf ministry. She said, what are you talking about? And I told her what happened. She said, isn't God amazing? Yeah, kind of. So my first appointment out of seminary, instead of being in a nice 
big church or on my way to the greatness of a big church, my first appointment was to spend quarter time divided between three deaf congregations, Magathy Church for the Deaf, where I later became the pastor, the Baltimore Christ Church for the Deaf, and in Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. Church for the Deaf, all started by one man who was deaf himself. But that was a quarter time of my time. Another quarter time was to be the chaplain for the deaf and hearing services impaired division at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which is a federal psychiatric hospital. I worked with deaf psychotic patients who signed like hearing psychotic patients to talk. Very interesting work there. And the other half of my time was spent as the assistant chaplain at Gallaudet University, Washington, D.C. A year later, I moved to be the pastor of Magathy Church of the Deaf for the next five years since I left deaf ministry. But the things that I saw and heard while I was in deaf ministry will stay with me forever. One is my deaf father, whose name was Ed Johnson. He called himself my deaf father, who's the lay leader of the church. And he actually had a son my age, and he called us the twins, the hearing twins. And he was a pip. I'll go ahead and tell you this story. I won't tell you what he said, but um, when you're learning a new language, it's very difficult to learn how to translate some things like hymns and scripture. So I read the scripture for the coming Sunday. We were getting close to Christmas, and it said, the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary, and she conceived and bore a child. And I said, how in the world would you sign that? And he showed me something. And on Sunday, I stood in front of the congregation, I signed what he showed me. The whole congregation went, oh, oh. And I realized I had done something very wrong. And I looked in the back of the church. Ned's wife was smacking him in the arm going, why, 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 why? And he said, I thought you knew I was kidding her. I was kidding her. I was kidding her. What I said was so foul and terrible. You could not, I can't even say it here. There are no English words for what I said. It was so bad. But Ed also would go out with the deaf choir. We had a choir that signed hymns because these people grew up in deaf schools going to Worship, and they like the old rugged cross in sign language, just like y'all like the old rugged cross sung. They like the old hymns. They didn't like this new stuff. But they would go out and they would do a presentation and they would explain to the congregation wherever we visited that they could ask any question they wanted about being deaf, any question at all. People asked some very personal questions at that time, like, how do you, do you have babies? Yes, we have babies. Now, I did call once. I had a pregnant member, and I called to see if they had a Lamaze class in sign language, and the woman said to me, literally, I don't think deaf people have children. I was like, is there a grown up I can talk to there? Deaf people do indeed have children and get married and have jobs and all these other things. But that's how people, this is not the dark ages, folks. This is 1986. That's what people were asking and saying in 1986. So we would take this, we called it the deaf dog and pony show. We'd go from church to church. They'd sign old hymns and they'd ask certain questions. And someone would always say at the end of the program, I will be praying for you to be made whole. And Ed, like Jesus, would sigh deeply. And he'd answer and he'd say, voice for me, voice. And I'd say with what I knew was coming out of his hands, I have been made whole in Jesus Christ. I just can't hear you and I don't need to hear you to be made whole. The worst days that I spent in deaf ministry were the days when children in my congregation would say to me, I wish you were my mother. I'd say, why? Mama loves you, but Mama doesn't talk to me. Because most hearing parents with deaf children never bother to learn sign language because they want them to be normal. They're normal, they just can't hear. Now, when I was serving the deaf church, a woman who's a good friend of mine from a seminary was serving a church not too far from me, and she called me one day and said, I really need you to come talk to my neighbor. She's not a member of the church, not a person of faith, but I need you to talk to her. I said, sure, why? She said, she has a deaf baby. And I went to meet her, and she was diagnosed as deaf in the delivery room because she had Wardenburg syndrome. Kelsey just said, Declan has Wardenburg syndrome. He does not have the characteristic stripe of white hair, does he? Not yet. Okay. He can develop it, though. Most people with Wardenburg syndrome have a streak of white hair and bright blue eyes that are almost translucent, sparkly. Even African-American people have these piercing blue eyes. The doctor recognized it in the delivery room and said, your baby is deaf. And she said, how do you know that? That's not right. He said, well, you're deaf. And she said, only in one ear. No one had ever told her what Wardenburg syndrome was. So 
though she didn't know she had it. It's one of the few congenital forms of deafness. Another is called Usher syndrome, where people are born deaf and become blind. That's a terrifying thing. But she didn't want to sign with her baby, and I said, why aren't you signing with her? Because when you're diagnosed in the delivery room, that's a great thing, because lots of times kids are four, five, six years old before they're diagnosed, they've lost all their language development. I'm so happy to hear Declan just chattering away up here with his little cochlear implants because he's getting language. He's making up for lost time. How old was he when he was diagnosed? Ten months. Ten months, mom and dad talking to him and thinking he's hearing what they're saying and he didn't know what their voices were in those days. But this little girl was diagnosed in the delivery room. It's an amazing thing. And here she is. She was six, seven, eight months, something like that when I first met her. Her mother wouldn't sign to her because she wanted her to be normal. So my friend said, you got to give her a wake-up call. So I went down, I met with her, and I said, why aren't you signing with her? She said, I want her to be normal. A social worker was coming to the house free of charge and teaching mom and dad sign language, but they didn't want to sign to their baby. So I thought, I felt God tapped me on the shoulder, and God told me what to say, and I said, well, give her to me. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, give her to me. I had just found out that year that I could never have children of my own, and I said, I'll take her. I'll take a deaf kid. I can't have any kid. I know her language. We'll talk. Well, she'll love me really well. And she said, get the hell out of my house, lady. I said, then learn how to talk to your kid right now. Well, I went to see her a few months later, and I said, are you signing with her? She said, yes, but she doesn't understand. And I looked at this little girl, and I said, Mommy, where is she? And she's like, she's right there. Can't you see her? I said, Daddy, where's Daddy? She looked all over that restaurant and went, I don't know. She's like, oh, my gosh, it's like she understands you. I said, no, she does understand me because I'm using her language. <laughs> the last time I saw her before I moved was when I took kids to deaf camp at West River, which is right down the road from where these folks lived. We had a whole camp full of deaf kids. And people from my congregation would come down and talk to them and have games and, you know, have an evening with them. I called her and said, why don't you come over and meet some of these deaf adults? And she came over and met them, and they said, ask us anything. She asked some very personal questions to them. They're like, wow. And they said, all right, we said we'd answer that. But one of the questions she said to them was, what do you all do for a living? And one said, well, I'm a cytologist. She said, I don't know what that is. I said, it's a medical thing. I'm not quite sure myself. The other guy said, I work for NSA. He said, I tell you what I do, but I have to kill you later. I was at my lay leader. Crazy man. Another woman said, I just got my master's to grab a social worker. She started crying. She said, they're all so normal. They're so normal. They're so normal. I said, yes, they are. And then she burst into tears and said, but I bet my daughter's going to grow up and marry a deaf man. I said, yeah, probably she will. But would you really be upset by that? If you knew sign language and you could talk to your son-in-law like you talked to your daughter? And she said, I'm afraid she's not going to love me because I'm not deaf. That was when Ed's wife, Flo, the one who smacked and said, why, 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 said, my mother never learned sign language. Half my brothers and sisters are deaf, half are hearing. She never learned sign language, and I've missed her every day since she died. She said, she will love you till the day she dies, but you need to learn her language. Last I heard, this woman was learning sign language fiercely. That's what it's like for deaf folks in the world. One of the things Dr. Oshinsky said at the first service that he didn't say here was that we have no stigma about wearing glasses, do we? What happens if you didn't wear your glasses? I would not have made it in the door. I'd have fallen down six times here in the door. We have no stigma about wearing glasses. Why is there a stigma about wearing a hearing aid? We need to take care of our hearing because what he said is absolutely true. What deafness does is isolates people. How many of you ever had, maybe when you were a kid, the philosophical discussion, what's just worse, being deaf or blind? If you had to choose between your sight or your hearing, which would you want to be? Would you rather be deaf or blind if you had to pick one? Hmm? You'd rather be blind? A lot of people say, I don't want to be blind. I couldn't see anything. Helen Keller, do you remember Helen Keller? Deaf and blind woman. She said, being blind separates you from things, being deaf separates you from people. And that's absolutely true. Which is why they're finding now this great link between dementia, early onset dementia, and hearing loss. Because people stop coming to church when they cannot hear. They stop going into public if they cannot hear. I cannot tell you how many people in this church said to me, you know, it's really weird when I wear a mask, I can't hear. No, it's because other people are wearing masks. We don't know how much we rely on lip reading, but only... 30% of spoken English shows on your lips. So we expect people to accommodate to our way of being in the world. 
So the heavens are telling the glory of God. They don't need words. God doesn't need words. And Jesus comes to a man in his need and heals him. Because to be deaf in this society is really tough. No, this is great. Absolutely great. Hey. Hello. No, we're happy to hear him talk. Raise your hand if you say he can talk all he wants right now. <laughs> Amen. Because that means he can hear because he can talk now. He can go. Just, yeah, let him. We're happy, right? Cool. You want to get some help from this time? Got that a while ago. Also, <laughs> he is the assistant preacher. Ready? You gonna preach for me? It's okay, it really is. You, you're proving my point. You're really good. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you how many times at camp that I grab a kid with hearing aids before they went in the pool. Like, no, because that's nine thousand dollars. Her ear with little kids hearing aids sometimes. Um, okay. We need to do more to make all people feel welcome in the, the world of Jesus Christ here that we have. And that means learning sign language, because we've got a kid in our congregation, and if his technology fails, Declan will not be able to hear anything. So we need people who are willing to talk to him in his language, or just to show him that we don't care that he cannot hear us as well as other kids can. It's really hard for me to sign with my non-dominant hand, and my other hand has arthritis in it, so it's hard to sign with that one. But we can learn sign language. We can learn some basic stuff and be able to communicate with other folks better than we do now. Because they might just be folks who can't hear us, but they're people who are made whole in Jesus Christ. We don't need to hear to be saved. We don't need to hear to be married. We don't need to hear to be pastors. Some of the most effective preachers I know are people who cannot hear, who preach in sign language to congregations who understand what they're saying. We even have a deaf-blind pastor right now. Because Peggy Johnson, who is a friend of mine who was a retired bishop, was in deaf ministry for years. She used to be a music teacher, and she was given a... She was called by um, a textbook publisher and asked to publish a... To, um, edit a book on music. She was a music teacher. She was given $20,000 to edit this book. She edited the book and turned it over to the Baltimore Washington Conference, and that is how Deaf Blind Camp started. So we have people who are willing to give of themselves to do this. The title of the sermon this morning was Hero Israel, which is what the Old Testament, so many phrases begin with Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What does the Lord require of you? Hero Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hero Israel does not mean here through years, it means listen with your heart and obey what God is asking us to do. So I hope that when Dr. Shinsey comes back, which he's going to do with his audiologist, that some of you will say, yes, maybe I do need to get my hearing checked. And if you need a hearing aid, wear it proudly and tell people and learn how to communicate with someone because that is how the good news of Jesus Christ spreads by what we share and what we do and what we are. So... Let us now sing together, Healer of our every ill. I'm going to ask Lambert if he would sing through the refrain in one verse. Sing through the refrain, and we'll join in on the verse, and then we'll go back to the refrain again. <laughs> 